All right, so today is Sin, a Breach of Relationship, part 12. All right, part 12. Okay, and it may be the last one. I'm gonna see if I'm gonna try and squeeze this all in today. So let's remember what we've been dealing with. We're trying to understand sin from a scriptural perspective, not the perspective maybe that we had our whole lives and people have told us. And what I believe I've been able to show you from scripture that sin is about breaching relationship. Okay, breaching expectations in a relationship. The word that's translated from the Hebrew and the Greek both have the same idea, the missing of the mark. Okay, and when we see the missing of the mark, it's always a relational thing. Okay, we saw this with, say, Lavan and Jacob, right? Yaakov and, and, and Lavan. It seemed to be a breach of relationship. We saw this even with, with uh, Abimelech, Abimelech and Avraham. This, there was this idea of, what have, why have you sinned against me? Well, because it seemed like a breach of relationship was really the problem, right? And we see that it's not just about us and our creator. Now, so sin's a breach of that relationship. Sin is missing the mark in the relationship based on the expectations of the relationship. And that's what I want to maybe teach here coming up soon is a whole teaching on expectations, Okay. Sin against Elohim is a breach of relationship with Elohim based on the expectations of that relationship, which, by the way, are set by him alone. You don't have a say in it. Most of the other, actually, all of the other relationships pretty much in your life you have a say in, and the other person has somewhat of a say in to some degree. Maybe not a parent with young little children, but as they get older, they get to have a voice. But when it comes to our creator, you get, you get no say, all right? Sin against people is a breach of relationship with them based on the expectations of that relationship. In this case, the expectations are set or held by each individually and may or may not have been agreed upon by that. By, together, they may not have agreed upon these things. And we've been talking about, in this last couple of parts, the idea of human beings breaching relationship and what sin is amongst people, all right? And so with that being said, remember, because we looked at Abimelech and Abraham and, and Jacob and Levon. We looked at some other things. Now I want us to go to Matthew 18, where we start talking about if your brother sins against you. Okay? So let's go to Matthew 18. This is a tremendously misunderstood section of Scripture and horribly abused in so many ways. So we're going to explain this thing. I've done this in several other teachings, but we're going to really clarify it today. So Matthew 18, we're going to begin in verse 15. And if your brother sins against you, go and reprove him between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word might be established. And if he refuses to hear them, say it to the assembly, and if he refuses to even hear the assembly, let him be to you like a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, what you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosened in heaven. And I say to you that if two or three, excuse me, that if two of you agree on earth concerning any matter that they ask, it shall be done for them by my Father in the heavens. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in their midst. All right. We've all heard this section. We all think we know what it means. Now, I hope you guys have had enough teaching for me to know and to really embrace that whatever's happening here there's assumptions being made by the writer, the teacher, the speaker. So what's the context here? Context is that Yeshua the Messiah is talking to his taught ones. This is what we have going on here, right? It says in verse one of chapter 18, at that time the taught ones came to Yeshua saying, so he's talking to his taught ones, all right? Now as this is going on, Yeshua is speaking to his taught ones, the assumption is that there's going to be some other basis for everything that's going on. Not the situation, but a Tanakh understanding. He assumes that they understand that all things are going to reference back to a source material of the right way to handle things, the right, the expectation of how things should or shouldn't be done. There's lots of hints here as to what Old Testament or Torah-related things are being at issue here, what are being brought to bear. We have things like the idea of two or three witnesses. We know that that's a legal requirement in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament, in the Torah, okay? Now, we also understand this binding and loosing and judgment. This is gonna take us back to Deuteronomy 17. We will go there, 
all right? But let me kind of start walking through this section little by little. So we start off in verse 15. If your brother sins against you, so you're having a problem where there's a breach of relationship with your brother. Not necessarily sin that's up with the Almighty. Sin with the Almighty already has ways to handle it. Your brother stole from you. Your brother cheated with your wife. Your brother you know, didn't handle returning items to you. Didn't handle, I mean, there's, there's, if it's sin Torah breaking, there already is a system of consequences in place. This is when they don't know what to do consequence wise, and so you're hoping to restore a breached relationship. So he says, if your brother sins against you, you go and reprove him. Oh, you guys don't understand that word. And you want to go and use that as a weapon. Okay? Reprove definition is to convince with solid, compelling evidence. Reprove is not to correct and smack necessarily the way you want to say, oh, I need to go and reprove him. No, go to that person and try to convince them with solid, compelling evidence. Make a strong case for your issue. I really don't appreciate what you did to me and this is why, okay? Or this is why I'm upset with you right now because you did this, this, and this, and bring compelling evidence. Remember, you got this verse about two to three witnesses coming up. The witnesses are there for what? To witness the evidence. They were there to, have, to be a witness to these things. All right, now, so verse 15 is talking about reproving. It says, if your brother sins against you, go and reprove him between you and him alone, okay? Now look, in Leviticus 19, and verse 17 and 18, it says, do not hate your brother in your heart, reprove your neighbor for certain and bear no sin because of him. This is likely what it's referring to, situations like Leviticus 19, 17. You can hold your place here if you wanna go look at it. All right, Leviticus 19, 17. Now, in that verse, it's, this is where it's dealing with, in, in sections, chapter 18, 19, 20, 17, 18, 19, 20 of Leviticus, that's a lot of expounding on Torah commands, giving more detail about different issues that are within those 10 commandments. Different ways you could be stealing or committing adultery or murdering or whatever it is. Now, so verse 17 says, do not hate your brother in your heart, reprove your neighbor for certain and bear no sin because of him. Do not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the children of Israel. You shall love your neighbors yourself. So this is, to me, clearly a horizontal problem, not a vertical problem. You're having a problem with your brother. Now, it's, I guess it's a vertical problem that he wants us to love each other. But when we struggle, we have to go to each other and we have to figure out how to make things right. Part of that may be to make a compelling case as to why somebody, whatever they're doing, it, they should stop doing that. Or something they're not doing, they need, to, they need to do something that you've been expecting and they're not doing it. So you have to go make your case. Now remember, this sin doesn't mean it was a breach of Torah. It means it was a breach of relationship. Breach of relationship is again an expectations problem. All right, but again it says in verse 17 here the idea of reproving. So again, he says, don't take vengeance or bear a grudge against the children of your people. He says, do not hate your brother in your heart. Reprove them. In other words, don't get all angry and bitter. Go and have a discussion and make a compelling case why they should understand how you got your feelings hurt or how they messed you up in some way or caused some harm or damage to you and how you'd like to restore that. By the way, your compelling case should also include a path to fixing it. I don't know why so many people have a problem with the understanding that if you're going to go and complain about something, you should also be bringing a solution. If, you know, not everything has one, but most of the time you can say, this is the problem, I don't like what you're doing, and this will fix it, okay? Don't just go and say, I'm mad at you because you made, did this and this and this. Well, well how, about, how are we gonna fix that, okay? I want you to say you're sorry, okay? So you say you're sorry. I don't know if that's really the thing you want. You don't want the breach to stop, okay? They can say they're sorry 50,000 times and not stop the breach and you still have a problem. <laughs> it doesn't change anything. Back to Matthew 18. Okay, can you see that Leviticus 19 is exactly the same thing we're talking about here, okay? Now, so again, reprove, 
When it talks about it, the Hebrew word there, we looked at reprove in the Greek, the Hebrew word here is the idea to decide or a judge. A judge means to consider or declare to be true or the case, to prove. So he says, reprove your neighbor or your brother. You're going to sit there and you're going to have them consider and, and, and together you're gonna to figure this out and declare what is actually true and what's really the case. Because you may go to your brother and find out you were wrong. You got all upset about nothing. Anybody have that happen? You were all about upset, you assumed a bunch of stuff, and then you came to find out that that's not exactly what happened. Or that wasn't their motivation. You were missing some of the information. You know, we get in so much trouble when we make decisions and jump to conclusions, often, if not always, with not enough information to make a proper judgment. Okay? So let's get back to verse 15 in chapter 18 of Matthew. It says, and if he hears you, you've gained your brother. So the word, the understanding of the word hear there is to listen, comprehend, understand, and receive what was said. Okay, if he listens, anybody talk to somebody who wasn't listening? <laughs> How do you know they're not listening? Because they're busy talking. They're arguing over, they're stepping over, they're talking over you, okay? Or the whole time, they're just waiting for you to stop talking so they can make their point. So they're not listening. So this is about if your brother, it says, if he hears you, if he's comprehending, because maybe he heard you, but he didn't understand what you were saying. He didn't understand the point you were making. He didn't get it. Anybody talk to somebody, you realize afterwards, they didn't get it, all right? They didn't understand, and then most importantly, did they receive what you were trying to say? That's what this is all about in Matthew 18. You got a problem with your brother, go to your brother, make your case. Now we have another issue. How does he respond to the case you make? There's been a breach. You go and you make your point. He says, if your brother hears you, you've gained your brother. In other words, you've restored the breach. Don't make it any bigger thing like you saved him or brought him to salvation or some other nonsense. Your relationship was restored. You've gained your brother back. But if he doesn't hear you, receive, understand, etc., comprehend what you're saying, then he says, go back and talk to your brother again, but this time bring two witnesses, right? He says, bring two or three, two or more witnesses. And why? Because we know from the Torah, any time that you're dealing with a debate over an issue between people, you should have witnesses. Now in this case, he's not saying bring witnesses to what happened, okay? Now we have a different problem here. You should have already brought witnesses if you needed to to make your case in the first place. He says go to your brother alone. If, if you need to, then you can say, look, I, other people were there. I can go get them involved. That's not what this is talking about. This is dealing with your brother not hearing you, okay? Your brother doesn't hear you, then you want to make sure that you bring respected people of good reputation, unbiased with you, who are going to watch you make your case to your brother so that you now have a witness that you at least made the effort, okay? They were there to witness you doing what you did. So these witnesses are to be highly respected and unbiased. They're not your best friends who are on your side who are gonna go with you to team up with you to pound on the brother, okay, or the sister, right? You're not gonna do that. Although that's the way most people do this. Oh, I need to bring witnesses, so I'm gonna get witnesses against that person. That's not what's happening here. It says, if your brother didn't hear you, take with you one or more witnesses. That, listen, it says, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word might be established that you said to your brother. So there's no doubt that, hey, I went to my brother. Anybody ever go to somebody and there was no witnesses to it, and then later you said, you know, the, somebody was, the brother was saying something like, oh, well, they've never talked to me. You're like, what are you talking about? I came to you. We talked about this. And they denied it. Anybody ever have that kind of experience? So now we have witnesses where you go, oh, no, no, no. These two people were there. They heard everything. They saw what I said. They were there. And they have a good reputation and they're unbiased. They don't take my side or your side. They're, they're neutral, right? Okay. And if he refuses to hear even that, okay, we're now in verse 17. Then it says, say it to the assembly. Say it to the assembly. 
So it's not so much say it to the assembly. Again, we're dealing with terrible translations at times, trying to understand idiomatic phrases and the way language is trying to express something from one language to the other. He's saying bring it before the assembly, okay? Bring it to have this done in front of the assembly. Okay, if that doesn't work, bring it to the assembly for judgment. So now we're moving into bringing something that's a matter that you haven't been able to figure out and settle, which brings us to Deuteronomy 17. Okay, so it says, bring it to the assembly, and if he refuses to hear the judgment of the assembly, let him be to you like a Gentile and a tax collector. All right, so we're not gonna read the rest of this for right now. Let's jump then, okay, to, let me see, do I wanna read this first? Yeah, let's read this first, and then we'll go to Deuteronomy 17. So verse 18, he says, because truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be having him bound in heaven, and whatever you have loosened on earth shall have him loosened in heaven. People will read this in Christianity and think this is some new power given to them, some new authority. When we go to Deuteronomy 17, this is nothing new, okay? Again, I say to you that if two of, or three on earth concerning any matter that they ask, it shall be done for them by my Father in heaven. That verse is taken out all by itself to be, basically say two or three people believe in Messiah, they could ask for anything and the Father has to do with like rubbing the genie bottle or something, okay? I'm sorry, but this verse flowed right after the other four verses that we read. And it's saying that when there's a situation, if it's brought ultimately to the assembly, that whatever they decide, if it's proper judgment, proper people doing the things, we'll understand Deuteronomy 17, then it is authorized from above. And it says that when, when two of you agree on earth regarding settling by Torah the right rulings, we're gonna read that in Deuteronomy 17, he says that on any matter of dispute, it shall be done for them by my Father in the heavens. He says, for where two or three are agreed together in Deuteronomy 17 level judgment, not just two or three and we're in agreement, so therefore they've got to take care of things. He says, together in my name and my authority, there I am in their midst. <laughs> they just don't know what they're reading because they don't know what it's referring to. If you don't know the Tanakh, you don't know all the hints. It's kind of like when we read John 8 and we read about the woman caught in adultery. You don't understand that at all if you don't understand the Tanakh. You don't know what the real issues are. You don't know what the rules of adultery are in terms of what you do with the people you find and how they're handled. So you have no idea. And of course, the hint he gives you there is the one without sin throwing that first stone. Because that's what really brings you back into the Torah because the witnesses, if they were true witnesses, get to throw the first stone. See, all of this stuff in the New Testament is almost useless to you, almost, if you don't know the Tanakh. And when I say almost, it's because yes, you may understand some of it, but it will be useless to you because you won't know what to do with it because to understand what's being said and what is, okay, you know what it says when your brother goes to you, if he doesn't hear you? You're not hearing what Yahweh's saying if you don't have the Old Testament as a base because you're reading the New Testament and don't understand what he's talking about. Because you can't. You cannot understand what's being, going on right here. You cannot understand Matthew 18 without a Tanakh understanding. And I'm gonna, I already took you to Leviticus 19 and we're gonna go to Deuteronomy 17 here in a second. So then Kepha came to him and said, Master, how often shall my brother sin against me? Oh, we're still talking about the same thing. Just in case anybody thought we changed topics. Oh no, as long as two or three agree in, in my name. And, so what, we say we're Christians and so we agree with each other, or we say we're Messianic and we agree with each other, he has to do something. That is not what this is talking about. It's still dealing with how often if my brother sins against me. We started out in verse 15, if your brother sins against you. Can we all agree we're talking about the same thing, same thing still? Nothing's changed, topic-wise. He says, up to seven times. And he should have said, no, I say up to seven times 70. Okay, so you go on and on from that same idea of your brother sins against you. But somewhere along the way, there has to be somebody to make a right ruling or a judgment if you're really having this big struggle with your brother, okay? And by the way, it may be that when you go to the assembly, the assembly tells you, just let it go. You're making a big thing out of nothing. That can happen. Now let's go to Deuteronomy 17 so we can see how this is playing out. 
And I'm going to take us back to Matthew eventually and read more of the chapter to give you the context of even why that came up. Let's go to Deuteronomy 17. I know I go there a lot and I quote it a lot, but I want you to see where it fits into this idea of sinning against your brother. All right, so in Deuteronomy 17, let's begin in verse 2. Okay? I think I want to, 2. Yeah, we're going to go all the way through 13. But it says here, When there is found in your midst or any of the cities which Yahweh your Elohim is giving you, a man or a woman who does what is evil in the eyes of Yahweh your Elohim in transgressing his covenant and has gone and served other mighty ones and bowed down to them or to the sun or to the moon or to any host of the heavens which I have not commanded and has been made known to you and you have heard and it was searched diligently, then see if true the matter is confirmed that such an abomination has been done. Okay. Then you shall bring... Uh, done in Israel, then you shall bring out of your gates the man or woman who has done this evil matter, and you shall stone them to death, the man or woman. And at the mouth of two or three witnesses shall he that is to die be put to death. He is to be put to death by the mouth of two witnesses, one or two, uh, not to be put to death by one witness. The hand of the witnesses shall be first against him to put him to death, and the hand of all the people last, so you shall purge the evil from your midst. So, so he starts off saying, when there's a Torah issue, that Torah issue has to be handled a certain way. And by the way, it's, it doesn't say anything about the judges coming up with anything other than witnesses and, and validating the witnesses. They're not trying to figure out the rules or how to handle something. So, but however, when a matter arises which is too hard for you to judge, you don't know what to do. Between blood and blood, plea and plea, stroke and stroke, whatever issues between two people that's not explicitly or specifically handled by Torah. He says, that those matters of strife within your gates, why are you going to your brother unless there's strife? You're having an issue, that's strife. Okay? He says, then you shall rise and go up to the place where Yahweh your Elohim chooses. So you go to the place that you see Yahweh is. Where is his anointed person? You're looking for, it says here, and come to the priest, the Levite, and to the judge who was in those days and shall inquire. And you're going to say, oh, well, we don't have priests and Levites and judges right now. Well, you know what? Let's go down to verse 12. It says, and the man who acts arrogantly so as not to listen to the priest who stands to serve there before Yahweh or Elohim or to the judge. So we're talking about whoever is standing before Yahweh serving. You know, there were Melchizedekian priests before there were Levitical priests. Read the book of Hebrews, you know there's Melchizedekian priests again. So let's go back to verse 9. It says, So you're going to come to the authority in the place where Yahweh places his name where he chooses, and you're going to ask them and inquire for them to declare the word of right ruling. In other words, take your knowledge of Torah, take your knowledge of how Yahweh wants things to be, and help us understand how to apply it into this strife that we're having. Because we don't know what to do here. He says, um, who sits in those days and you shall inquire. And they shall declare to you the word of right ruling. That was verse 9. And verse 10. And you shall do according to the words which they declare to you from the place which Yahweh chooses. And you shall guard to do according to all that they instruct you. Do according to the instruction in which they teach you. It says Torah there. But it's, they're going to apply and make a ruling. Doesn't mean that they're just going to say, well, you know, it says that you, you, know, you can't work on the Sabbath. Well, that's not the issue here. It says don't work on the Sabbath and you don't work on the Sabbath. No, this is two people having a breach of relationship and they don't know what to do about it. And it's not apparently fitting into a very specific pocket of Torah instruction. Because if it was, they would do all of those things straightforward. Any of you ever come to the ministry because there was an issue that wasn't black and white in the scripture? Many times. Happens all the time. Okay? And you got to know what to do. Now look what he says. He says, do according to Torah in which they teach you, according to the right ruling which they say to you, you do not turn right or to the left from the word which they declare. This is Yahweh speaking, saying, I endorse that when you go to the people that I put in place, that I'm binding that in heaven what they're binding in earth. Can we see that? Okay. He says, if you don't, verse 12, we're going to call that acting arrogantly. 
It says, and the man who acts arrogantly as to not listen to the priest who stands to serve there before Yahweh or Elohim, or to the judge, that man shall die. So shall you purge the evil from Israel and let all the people hear and fear and no longer do arrogantly. Can you see how that matches up with Matthew 18? Okay, so Matthew 18, this doesn't say start off with going to your brother and then bringing witnesses. This is already dealing with it where it's gotten escalated to the level of going to the judge. Matthew 18 saying, look, you should have handled this on a lower level first. You have a problem with your brother? Go to your brother. See if you can work it out. Well, it's, 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 he's not even understanding. He's not listening to me or she's not listening to me. Fine, bring some witnesses, see if that works who can help you with making your appeal by saying, look, we're here to witness that he genuinely wants to fix this or work this out or get you to stop, whatever it is, okay? Now, of course, most of the time when strife doesn't get fixed is because each person thinks they're right, nobody wants to give in and nobody wants to yield or own that they might be wrong. So it takes somebody to say, okay, here's my judgment. You're wrong, you need to stop that, or you're wrong, you need to stop this, or you needed to do that, but you didn't, so now you need to go make it right. Whatever it is, you need somebody to make that judgment. The kinds of stuff that was constantly being brought to David when he was king, or Solomon when he was king, these are all things that are not implicitly or explicitly expressed. Remember that woman with the baby, and the other one had their baby die, and they're fighting over the baby? There's no Torah specific for that. But you had to go to somebody to try to figure out the right way to handle this or to figure out what the truth was. And so there are these kinds of disputes that we always have. Look, if you wanted to have a law library to cover every possible, every possible dispute, go look in a, an attorney's office what a law library looks like. And all of the volumes of cases and statutes and things that have to do with the law that they could have to go back and reference to see if anywhere, anytime, somebody dealt with something like what you're dealing with. Our judges within Israel, within Messianic Torah Observer in Israel, are to use the much more simple Torah. But to apply the principles of it into the situation. And the literal parts of it, if there is something literal that is specifically handled in Torah, because it may be something but maybe they're missing it. Maybe the two people fighting are missing the fact that there really is a Torah straight issue that could be handled. Let's go back now to Matthew 18. Matthew 18, okay? I hope we see that it, you, now maybe you can understand Matthew 18 more correctly looking at it through the lens of Deuteronomy 17. He says, if your brother sins against you, go and reprove him between you and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained a brother. If he doesn't hear you, take one or more, uh, excuse me, with you, um, take with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, something might be established. It's all Deuteronomy 17 stuff. That's why we read the verses before the, if there's a matter too great for you to handle, it talks about the two or three witnesses and the throwing of the first stone, right? Let's go into the earlier part of this chapter so you can start to see the contents. Let's start in verse 11, okay? The son of Adam has come to save what was lost. By the way, you gotta go listen to the Are You Saved teaching. You gotta understand what that means to save what is lost, okay? You, don't, you, can't, you can't look through the Christian lens of lost, meaning you're doomed to hell or something. That is not what this is about. Okay, when you're seeking something that's lost, it's something that you had, all right? You never see anybody looking for their glasses if they don't own glasses. People with glasses, you find them looking for them all the time. <laughs> What's the matter? I lost my glasses, all right? My father would lose them and they would be right here on his head. I can't find my glasses. <laughs> We belong to Yeshua, yes or no? Okay. And there are those that are sheep that have gone astray. They've lost their way. He explains that in the next verse. He says, what do you think if a man has 100 sheep and one of them goes astray? Would he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go seek the one? So can we agree that the one that he's going after started out as part of the 100? It wasn't just a random 
you know, rebellious sheep that was just wandering around. They say, hey, look, there's a sheep over there. Maybe I should go get him. It started out off as this shepherd's sheep. It was one of his sheep. And if he should find it, truly I say to you, he rejoices more over the one, right, the sheep that, that he found than the 99 that did not go astray. So now he's talking about the one that is lost has gone astray. Okay, all you Christians pay attention. You're not gonna like what I have to say. Nobody, this is gonna make you mad, nobody who has not been bubble popped, covenanted and called out, in literal sense can go astray. There's nothing to go astray of if you don't know what you're supposed to do. Do you understand that? Oh, and it doesn't mean they're not doing horrible, sinful things, so to speak, or evil things or some other horrible thing, but to go astray means you had to know what to do and then you left. You went off in the wrong direction. That sheep was part of a herd going straight and then it went astray. So again, we're not seeking the lost, meaning all the worldly people that are just sinfully doing whatever. He's seeking those whom were his that have gone astray. And by the way, in doing so, the message gets out to everybody, the whomsoever wills will come. But he says, I have not come. I'm not gonna quote the verse here, I'm not gonna tell you where it is, but you know there's a verse that says, I have not come except for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Oh, so that's what this is all about. They're, they're lost sheep that were mine, but they've gone astray. It's simple, it's right there, but we are not taught right. We are not taught right at all. He says, and if he shall find it, he rejoices more over that sheep than the 99. Thus it is not the desire, thus it is not the desire of your father who is in the heavens that, the one, that one of these little ones should be lost. Which little ones? The ones that are his. Oh, but we're all children of Elohim. Well, yes, but we're not his until he calls us. He's allowed us all to go off in the wrong direction, starting with Adam when he started things in the wrong direction. Now, it's through calling and selection and bubble popping that he then brings us back to realize there is an Elohim. We had the relationship at the beginning, and then we chose to go astray. And then he just said, oh, you know what, I'm tired of all of this, go. I, I disperse you into the four corners, so to speak. I disperse you to the winds. Go and scatter everywhere. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, you know, mix you and scatter you and, and sift you like through a sieve and you're just gonna be mixed everywhere. It's part of the teaching on knowing our identity, right? Discover your identity. Okay, now. So understand that that now leads into if your brother sins against you. He's saying, look, this is how your father feels about those that are his. You should feel similarly about a brother in the flock. You're part of the sheep. So that leads into this. Then we go through the Matthew 18 reading, and then we drop down again to this sort of idea of uh, forgiveness, right? He says, well, how many times? And in verse 22, he says, I do not say to you up to seven, but up to 70 times seven. Because of this, the reign of the heavens is like a certain man a sovereign who wished to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was unable to pay his master, uh, unable to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. Then the servant fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me and I shall pay you all. Okay, so this is somebody who's his, owed him a debt, and I was begging for mercy. This isn't just some random person, okay? Now, okay, he says that he's asking for patience, and I'll pay you all. The master of the servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. So that's the repentance process, right? You say, please be patient with me. I will pay it all. I'll do what needs to be done. And so he forgives him. He says, and that servant then went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 pieces of money, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat and said, pay me what you owe. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him saying, have patience with me and I shall pay you all. But he would not. And he went and threw him into the prison until he pay, should pay back the debt. I never understood the logic of that. You can't pay me, so I'm gonna put you in prison so that you can not pay me. I don't know how that's supposed to work, okay? 
You know, it's kind of like the credit cards do, right? You, you mess up on a payment at 12% interest, so they figure the best way to get more money out of you properly when you can't pay is to triple your rates up to 25 or 6%, right? Or double your rates. I, I never understood how that made any sense. You couldn't pay it at 12%, so let's charge you more. Dumb. All right, then his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, have patience with me and I shall pay all. But he would not, and he went and threw him into the prison till he should pay the debt. And when his fellow servants saw what he had done, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master called him and said to him, Wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt, seeing you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, as also I had compassion on you? And his master was wroth and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that, he was, that was due to him. So also my heavenly Father shall do to each of you from his heart, uh, does not forgive his, uh, excuse me, forg um, shall do to each of you from his heart, does not, if, if from his heart does not forgive his brothers his trespasses. Look at the context of all of this, right? The context starts off talking about these issues and having problems, and then we have a way to dis handle those disputes, and then we're told that even in those disputes now, it's about forgiveness and compassion, so make sure you have that when you go to your brother when you have an issue. And be careful that your father's already forgiven you your debts <laughs> before you're so tough on your brother. Lots of verses that cover these kinds of things. The plank and the twig, you know, the plank in your eye and the twig in your brother's eye, all the same point, all right, the same point. We're, we expect him to forgive us, and yet we're not as, that forgiving of other people. We expect compassion, we don't give compassion. We expect mercy, we don't give mercy. Really, really sad, but that's, this is, again, we're talking about breach of relationship. So this servant had a breach of relationship with his master, then he said, I get it, I'm sorry, I will pay it back. Please be patient with me, I can get this done. So an effort was made by, by the other side of the equation to say, look, give me a chance, I'll, I'll, I'll fix it. And he, and he said, fine, no problem, I'll forgive your debt. But then he got the same situation then come to him. He didn't have the same reaction though, did he? He didn't imitate what was done to him, the compassion and the mercy he received, the generosity he received. And so, we are just as disappointing in the eyes of the Father when we do the same thing. He does so much for us and then we do not treat people well. All right, we do not treat people well. But I want you to make sure we're getting this Matthew 18 deal, all right? That this is when you and your brother are having a problem. First of all, you should be able to go to your brother and fix most of those problems. And if you, and if you don't fix it or can't fix it, it may be that you're having a problem like in the rest of the chapter where it talks about you're not appreciating how much was done for you and you're just being a little bit impatient or lack of compassion on your brother. But if there's genuinely a real problem with your brother, then you should bring it to the assembly and get a judgment like in Deuteronomy 17. That's basically what he's talking about here, okay? That's basically what he's talking about. Now, where are we time-wise? I think we're perfect for where I wanna go with this. All right, good. So, that being said, let's go to the very beginning where we see sin popping in, which is Genesis 4. Okay, we're gonna kind of wrap this up. I am gonna finish this today, all right? Bray sheet four, and we're gonna look at verses one through eight, all right? And Adam knew Chava, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have gained a man from Yahweh. And again she gave birth to his brother Hevel, and Hebel became a keeper of sheep, but Cain became a tiller of the ground. All right, so we had a farmer and we had a shepherd. And it came to be in the course of time that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to Yahweh. And Hebel also brought of the first fruit, or firstborn of his flock, and of their fat, and Yahweh looked at Hebel and his offering. And he did not look at Cain and his offering. And Cain was very wroth, and his face fell. Okay, so first of all, what's happening here? Each one did something, and the authority, or the one they brought it to, appreciated and respected one and not the other, received one and not the other. Okay, so Cain's face falls, okay? And he's wroth, though. So he's not just, I did something, I realized, oh man, he didn't like that. It wasn't what I was supposed to do. 
My face might fall, so to speak, as I'm sad or disappointed in myself, and I may ask, well, what could I do different? What could I do better? What happened, right? I start analyzing what happened. No, no, he's angry. But why is he angry? He's angry because he liked his brothers, but he didn't like mine. Why do you like my brothers and not mine? Now, of course, he should know better. We're going to find that out in a second. But his reaction right away was to be angry, but not with himself. He's mad at Yahweh and he's mad at his brother. And Yahweh says to Cain, because he sees this, he says, why are you wroth and why is your face fallen? In other words, why are you sad? Why are you upset? Why are you all upset about? Any good parent sees a child like that, goes over and says, what? why are you angry? What are you upset about? What's going on? And Cain says, I oh know he says to Cain, if you do well, in other words, what I expect in this relationship, he says, is there not acceptance? Let that be a lesson to every Christian who's being taught that what you do doesn't matter. Yeshua did it all for you. If you do well, there's acceptance. Oh no, Yeshua did the acceptance and I don't have to do anything. Oh my gosh. Look, I, was, I knew I was gonna bring this up. So I saw a video that was on, I'm gonna pull up my YouTube and there's like a little video that said law versus grace or something like that, okay? <laughs> First of all, for all of you watching, you need to watch the teaching I did called The Search for the Doctrine of Grace. And you need to know there's no such thing. It's not a doctrine. And it talked about how there's been this tension between law and grace all through the Bible. No. Christianity invented the idea that there's a tension between the two. Nowhere in the Bible is there tension between the two. First of all, law is the law, and grace is a concept that has to do with meriting favor, not unmerited favor. Go listen to the teaching. But in this video, okay, it basically lays out, and this is because we're talking about here that if you do well, the video makes a statement or claim that, well, you know, in the beginning, in the, in the Tanakh, there was the, um, the law, and, and you know, the people tried real hard, but it was just, they just couldn't do it. And so God realized that, and he sent his son and you know, gave us grace. All right, do you realize how insulting that is to the creator? That you're saying that he made a 4,000 year mistake and gave people something they couldn't do because they did the best they could and failed. You know what, I have a book too. Everybody that did the best they could didn't fail, they succeeded. All right? I do not see everybody trying to keep Torah failing in my book. I see all the people that didn't try to keep Torah failing in the book. All the people that go astray failing in the book. There is not a single recorded incident that Torah was too hard to do. Not a single one. And by the way, if you could stop being a baby about it and just be honest with yourselves, you would recognize there's not a single thing in the law you can't do. There's not a single thing that's hard. Oh, well, it's hard, you know, because my boss wants me to work Saturday. No, the world makes it hard. Keeping Saturday is not hard. Your choice to have a career that requires Saturday, that's your problem. Change careers. Put him first. Is it really hard to keep different holy days? No. Is it hard to eat differently? No. Is it hard to not steal? It shouldn't be. Is it hard to not murder? No. Is it hard to not commit adultery? No. In other words, none of these things are actually difficult. Oh, the law is so hard, it's impossible to keep. No, it's impossible for the flesh to keep it. Because the flesh is enmity to the Almighty. So stop being fleshly, it's easy to do. It's not hard to do. You can't point to one commandment that's actually physically or emotionally or cha mentally challenging to do. Okay? You don't need an advanced degree in theology to do any of the commandments. But yet, this is what's being put forth. And I'm listening, go, and I played it for Elder. I said, he actually made the statement that, you know, they did the best they could and they couldn't do it. <laughs> Such, and people listening going, oh, yeah, I agree, wow. The lies and lies. Look, if you do well, is there not acceptance? That's the very first children, right? If you do well, is there not acceptance? 
By the way, that's all the way through. What are the words we're looking to hear? Well done. So if you do well, well done. Good and trustworthy servant. <laughs> it's amazing. He goes, but if you do not do well, by the way, do well and not do well is, what's the actual cause of doing well or not doing well? Again, I already told you it's not because it's hard or difficult or challenging. It's gonna be because of your desire. I want to or don't want to do it correctly. It's the self-sovereignty, self-willed thing. So he says, if you don't do what's required properly, it's gonna be because sin is crouching at the door. In other words, you're right there ready to breach relationship. And its desire is for you, but you should master it. Now, I, I wanna reword that a little bit. It's your desire that has sin crouching at the door. It's not that sin is, has a desire for you. This is, again, a bad translation that tries to make it sound like that an outside thing is doing things to you. Your desire has sin sitting at the door. In other words, it's just waiting to be pointing at you, saying, well, you breached. You breached, it's right there. Sin is crouching the door is like saying it's imminent. It's not like, like it's like literally this thing sitting there watching you. You're now just, you're right there heading down, a, you know we talk to people how you're heading down a path to destruction, you're heading down a path to this or that. That's what he's saying is, if you're going to let your desire not match my desire but be your fleshly desire, you're going to head directly, imminently, right into sin. You're gonna breach relationship. And said in Cain, told his brother Hebel, he said, Cain told Hebel his brother, and it came to be when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Hebel his brother and killed him. <laughs> People, you gotta own your stuff. The very first time this comes up, Cain won't own it. Actually, early to that, Adam and Hebel wouldn't own it. Everybody's pointing the finger at something else. Well, you know, Adam, what happened? Well, the woman you gave me, you know. However, what happened? Well, you know, the snake, he, you know. Nobody wants to own anything. Why is David a man after Yahweh's own heart? Because he owned it. He was shown what he did. He said, that was me. I own it. I'm sorry. Guilty. Okay? He never blamed anybody. That's a man after Yahweh's own heart. So when you talk about this breach, this is the very first breach. It says, look, if you do well, if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. You know what, let's, uh, I link this to Proverbs 19. Let's go there real quickly. All right, Proverbs 19. And we're gonna look at verse two. Also desire without knowledge is not good, and he who hurries with his feet sins. The foolishness of man perverts his way, and his heart is wroth against Yahweh. Is that exactly what's going on here in Genesis 4? And say, so this links the desire to missing the mark and to foolishness which perverts man's way. Desire without knowledge. Okay, so what's knowledge? Proverbs 1.7 says the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and discipline. So knowledge is relational. So it's saying here, desire without the fear of Yahweh is not good. Because then you know that you're not desiring correctly. Because if you fear Yahweh, you'll, you'll take that desire and have discipline and control over it and make sure it's aimed and focused correctly. You know, in Proverbs 9:10, it says, the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the set-apart one is understanding. So when you breach relationship, you're disconnecting yourself from the source of all of that and now you're running off and just doing what you want. You're letting your desire of the flesh to go in whatever direction you want. And we see that that's where sin is linked in. He says, he who hurries with his feet to do his own desire sins. Desire without the knowledge is what your feet are running after. Desire that's not fear of Yahweh, that's not with understanding, it's not with relationship of above. That's gonna lead you into a breach of relationship. We should understand that, it's critical, okay? Let's go to... Ephesians 5. I better read this quickly. <laughs> I got more verses than I thought here. 
Verse 1, become then imitators of Elohim as beloved children. That's how you maintain relationship. He wants you to imitate him. When you don't, you breach. And walk in love as Messiah also loved us and gave himself for us a gift and an offering to Elohim for a sweet-smelling fragrance. But whoring and all uncleanness or the greed of gain, let it not even be named among you as it is proper, as is proper among set-apart ones. So there's certain things that you should not be known to be doing. He says, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather thanksgiving. And I've gone through these verses before and explained those. I'm not going to do that today. For this you know, that no one who whores, nor an unclean one, nor one greedy of gain, who is an idolater, has an inheritance in the reign of Messiah and Elohim. Hmm. Your behavior matters. Your choices matter. Otherwise, it says, you do not have an inheritance in the rain. Oh, no, we're saved. Once saved, always saved. I can do coarse jesting and filthiness and, and you know, all this other stuff. Ah, no problem. He says, you don't have an inheritance. He says, let no one deceive you with empty words. Stop watching Sunday preachers. Let no one deceive you, or actually half the Messianic, more than half the Messianic. I mean, these are all Messianic people that I'm, I'm listening to that are just unbelievable what they're teaching. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these, because of these, these what? The empty words, the wrath of Elohim comes upon the sons of disobedience. Now, I just want to stop right here for a second and say, do you understand that these are people who fall into possibly Two categories. I want to say this. Likely they're in two categories. They're disobedient, one category, because they listened to empty words and believed it. So they don't think they're being disobedient. Law's been done away with. It was nailed to the cross. You know, that was the old. This is the new. All these things were changed and done away with. Oh, that video I was watching also talked about how the sacrifices ended with Yeshua. No, they didn't. They ended when the temple got destroyed. And everybody who was a first century believer in, from, from the time Yeshua died till the temple was destroyed went and did temple service. They made their sacrifices. It did not stop. That's a lie out of Christianity. Okay? He says the other category is those that just willfully are disobedient because they just don't want to do it. So it's not even about the empty words. He says, but let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of this, the wrath of Elohim comes down on the sons of disobedience, because you will then choose to find empty words to match your willingness to or your desire to disobey. You can find a teacher out there or a teaching that will back up every dumb thing you want to do. Do you understand that? Every wrong thing you want to do, you can find a teaching that says you can. Some of them will even say you should when you shouldn't. And some of you are thinking, why do you pick on all this? Do you understand my job? You don't understand my job. Okay, my job is to make sure that I've declared aloud and cried not. Spared not, cried aloud. And you need to know, as is said often in the scriptures, that there are anti-messiahs out there. There are those, why would he say let no one deceive you with empty words unless people were deceiving people with empty words? So then you should ask the question, what does that look like today? Almost everybody you see on YouTube. Almost anybody with a microphone. Oh, you just are so cocky, you think it's just, you know what, don't read into any of that stuff. Narrow is the path. If you find it, why? Because they're busy listening to ear tickling, deceptive, empty words, okay? Look, you don't like me, that's fine. Don't listen, turn the channel, go watch something else. But if you want to hear the truth, then listen, I'm just speaking the truth here. And I'm reading it from here. And you need to know what that looks like today. And it probably looks like your favorite teacher out there that you love so much, who's filling you with all kinds of nice feeling empty words. How do you know? Well, because he's probably telling you, uh, this is the other thing I love. I love people trying to make this idea that we get the opportunity to keep Torah now. What? It's an obligation. Oh, but they can't ever say that. They cannot say that it's an obligation. It's something we can choose to do out of love. That is ridiculous. 
you, you do choose to do. But if you remember, Deuteronomy 10, 12 says, you fear him first, then you do what he said, then you end up loving him. So we don't do because we love, we love because we do. Because in doing, we see his love. Exodus 19 into Exodus 20. Exodus 19, the covenant that's given is an obligation. If you agree, obligate yourself to do everything that comes out of my mouth, I will obligate myself to take you as my people. I mean, it's, it's, this is not like some sort of, you know, major theological doctorate degree thing. It's simple. Are you going to trust me enough to do what I say? There's a good teaching. Do you trust Yahweh enough to do what he says? Okay. Do you trust him? What's the name of it? Do you trust him enough to obey him? Right? All right. And that's really what he's asking. Do you trust me enough to obey me? But then if the answer is yes, then you're obligating yourself. Oh, no. We get the opportunity to, whenever we feel like it, we could do a little Torah. Oh, please. Really? That breaches relationship. Continuing here. He says, therefore do not become partakers with them. With the disobedient ones listening to empty words. Don't participate and go following all these other teachers who are giving empty words. Find your Ephesians 4.11 teachers. And I'm telling you, they're not easy to find. I've looked and can't find any of them. You guys feel you found one in me. You're luckier than I am or more blessed than I am. I can't find any. That's, I look, trust me, I look. Okay? Elder, you look, did you find any? Nope, okay. Rabbi Tom, you find any? No. Nope. okay. It's not easy. I know they're there somewhere. But don't just think every popular guy who's got a YouTube channel must be an anointed appointed. He says, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the master. Walk as children of light. What does walk as children of light mean? It means do the obligated stuff. What's obligated? I don't know. How about Deuteronomy 6 where it says that you are to love him with all your might, strength, right? The Shema and the Vahafta. That's obligated. Actually, the Shema is obligated. I'm going to hear and do what Yahweh said. He says... Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Yeshua says, I am the truth. Psalm 118 says, the Torah is truth. The truth put on flesh, John 1, 14. Now this is what's important, verse 10. You want to do this right, you want to not breach, then you have to figure out and prove what is well-pleasing to the master, not your brother or your sister or your mother or your father or your pastor or your this or your that. You need to figure out, because you were once darkness and now you are supposed to be light, so you have to do what? You have to prove what is well-pleasing to the master. Is breaking the Sabbath pleasing to the master? Look what happened with Cain. He made an offering wrong. But by the way, he was in trouble because it was expected that he knew the right way to do it. Otherwise, it would be wrong of Yahweh to be disappointed in him. He says, well, look, if you do it right, won't you be okay? You know how to do it. Do it right. I know people, what they focus on is the wrong part of that. Well, this is why his offering was wrong. No, who cares why it was wrong? The point was, it was wrong and he knew better. Okay? And he could have fixed it. Instead, he was all upset that he got in trouble. See, that's the way you guys get too. When you get sent to me or I find you and I go and correct you, rather than receive the correction, you're mad at me for correcting you. Or mad at whatever brought it up that somehow you got busted doing whatever you did. That, now you're being like Cain. I want you to think that next time that happens. Don't act like Cain. Go to Colossians chapter one. We got like one more verse to read here. Colossians chapter one. Okay. And we'll look at verse 10. Actually, we'll go start in verse nine. This is also why we, from the day we heard, have not ceased praying for you and asking that you be filled with the knowledge of his desire in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. He wants you to have knowledge and to be filled with the knowledge of his, the creator's desire in all wisdom, fear of Yahweh, right, is the beginning of wisdom, and spiritual understanding, which is also comes from the fear of Yahweh, in order that, verse 10, 
you walk worthily of the master, pleasing all, not all people, pleasing him, doing what's pleasing in all things, that all things should be pleasing. Bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of Elohim. This is our whole point, okay? Let me wrap this up for us. Sin, let's be careful with this. Sin has two different aspects that we would focus at. All of them are breach of relationship, okay? Breach of relationship with, with Elohim has certain consequences. When we sin, if we are in relationship and breach that relationship with him, it bears certain consequences. I want you to understand, those consequences are not the same for those that are not in relationship. So all the friends you have that are out there sleeping around and doing whatever, yeah, that's wrong to do, but if they were never in relationship with Yahweh, Yahweh's not holding that against them. There are consequences, maybe STDs and some other nonsense that they're gonna get from all of that. There's all kinds of bad things happen when you do things Yahweh said is not good for you, but he's not looking down at them like you awful sinner when he has no relationship with you. He does look at you once he pops your bubble and you refuse to change like you're an awful sinner. Because now he's going to reveal himself to you and what you should and shouldn't be doing. Because remember, you can't breach a relationship without a relationship. Okay, I know a lot of people didn't like when I said that it's not sin when somebody does it, it's outside of the covenant. Well, it isn't, unless it's breaching. Now look, if I'm married to somebody and we're not in covenant with Yahweh and I go and commit adultery, I've breached a relationship, but it's just with my spouse, not with the Elohim. Because if we're not in covenant with Elohim, that breach has nothing to do with that relationship with Elohim. It will have everything to do with the relationship with my wife. You understand? So there's two types of breach between people and between Elohim, and then there's two different contexts, in or outside of relationship with Elohim. Because you can have a breach of relationship with people in the context of relationship with Elohim, where therefore your breach may affect both relationships. Because what you do may also be a problem for Yahweh as well as for the person that you had a problem with. Outside of relation with Yahweh, it may just be between you and that person. So I'm not diminishing sin at all, okay? But you have to understand scripturally what it is. So what are we to do? We are to seek what is well-pleasing to the master so that we maintain relationship. So we don't breach relationship. So we do everything to be properly acceptable in the relationship. Husbands and wives, your marriages will be a lot better if you figure this out. There are things that are only, well, I shouldn't, let me rephrase that. To all you husbands and wives, there are things that are not acceptable to your spouse in that relationship. And yet you still do them and wonder why you struggle in a relationship. Well, you're thinking, well, I'm right and it's not a Torah problem, but it's not acceptable to them. So now you have to sort it out. Either they have to come to the place where they accept it, or you're gonna to have to adjust. And it could be either one. That, I'm not saying one has to be or the other. Husband and wife get together, I sit down and counsel them. Sometimes the person who's all upset realizes, you know what, that thing that I'm all upset about, I just need to accept it. It really isn't something that's that big a problem, but for me it was. Because it may be the way you were raised or your background or some other trigger that makes this thing that for a lot of other people wouldn't be a big deal, but for you it's a huge thing. So maybe you need to let that go. Or maybe it is a huge thing and you can't let it go and maybe your husband or, or wife, whoever the other side of it, has to then say, I need to adjust. But realize that's where the relationship problems are. Do you understand what's acceptable to the other person? Now, of course, we always have the verse that says, two can't walk together unless they agree. Most of us, sadly, okay, and it's not your fault, Culturally, we just don't do this. Most of us, if not all of us, have never had required education before getting married. In other words, how do you vet someone, discuss expectations, set them properly so that whoever you marry, you actually can walk in agreement with? So you're looking at two things normally when you get married, okay? I'm gonna look at it from two different sides. We'll look at it from the man and the woman. The man is looking at, am I attracted and can I tolerate whatever nonsense may be coming from that side? Wait, I'm gonna say the same thing about the men, so I don't think I'm picking on the ladies. Ladies are looking at it from, are they attractive and can they provide, and by the way, provide may be before attractive, 
Okay, because I've seen a lot of very pretty women with some not so attractive men, but they can provide real well. All right? So can they provide and can I tolerate their nonsense? That's as hard as it gets. That's as deep as it seems to get. Okay, and by the way, the more attracted or desiring of the provision that you're gonna get, for the man it may be just the more physically attractive, for the woman it may be more about the provision and protection that they're able to provide, the less they're paying attention to those irritating things that show they're not actually walking in agreement. The, the, the need that you guys have to understand is that we are not taught that figuring out if you agree about your walk I don't mean just like vertical. I mean everything. Do you agree on how you're going to handle children? How you're going to handle finances? How you're going to handle social activities? How you're going to handle food? How you're going to, I mean everything in life. Do you even agree on how to do these things? Because two can't walk together unless they agree. I didn't know, for example, before I got married, that temperature was a problem. <laughs> Why is everybody laughing? <laughs> Apparently, Men and women are off by about 10 degrees on that one. Until menopause, then it reverses. <laughs> or balances out, okay? But I mean, nobody gives you any heads up about these things, that these are things you'll have to adjust on. Okay, I grew up with my mother always wearing a sweater because she never made an issue of it, let the house be as cold as the men wanted because she had only men in her house, a husband and three boys. So she just always wore a sweater. Okay? And so, you know, my wife and I, we didn't understand all that. And I walk into the apartment coming home from work and she's got it about, you know, what I thought was 10 degrees too hot. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And she's as happy as can be. Okay? But of course, if I wanted it where I wanted it, she'd be freezing. So you have to learn to talk about these things and then adjust. And then you have to come into an agreement. If she was only going to push for her temperature, I was only going to push for mine, we would have a problem. Because somebody's going to always be upset and disappointed and frustrated that it's not their way. Okay? Unless one decides freely to say, I don't really care. You can have what you want. All right? I know I say this all the time, but it could be something as simple as the TV controller. See, I'm not one of those men that's like a lot of you guys. My wife is, is, you know, comes home and we go to sit down. Or if I'm already sitting down and she goes to sit down... And she'll say, you know, something like, well, are you watching that? Or I said, look, I don't care. Here's the controller. Most of the time I do that. Unless I'm watching something like something just happened in the news. I want to just make sure I understand what happened. Then I give it the controller. Okay? But if I'm watching anything that's just entertainment, I don't care. I just stop what I'm doing and I give it to her. That's the way we walked. That was not something we, she asked for. But what if, what if I was someone that I need to watch what I need to watch and that's just too bad on you or vice versa? It's these little things that kill relationships. So the expectations aren't met. It's not well-pleasing, and now we have a breach. You know? Well, you never let me watch what I want. Why does it always have to be your temperature? Why does everything have to always be your way? Well, it shouldn't. It should be agreement. But we don't agree. Come to agreement. That's what negotiation's about. That's what discussion should be about. It's like coming to an agreement. Okay? Yeah, I always said, I want you to, look, let's understand. Let's go back to the simple basics of the covenant. Yahweh did not say, obey me. End of story. He said, if you obey me, I will give, this is what I'm offering you. Do you, do you like the terms? I want you to obey, not something you necessarily want to do, but you want the things I'm going to give you if you do obey, which is nobody's going to fight you and kill you and murder you. Your crops are going to be great. Nobody's going to be barren. You're going to be in this wonderful paradise of a situation. So then you say, okay, I'll take the deal. You get what you want, I get what I want. That's negotiation to some degree, okay? Now, it wasn't negotiable in terms of Yahweh on the details. It was a very straight blank thing. That's why he didn't say, here's a list of what I'm asking. I want you to agree to it. He said, you have to agree to everything I will ever say. Now, you didn't have to say yes, but that was the agreement that was laid out. So that's why I talk to you guys as husbands and wives before you, well, as single men and women before you get married. You guys need to figure out, do you have enough agreement in how to walk your life? Because you think you do until you get married and you realize 
You didn't, you didn't think of everything, you know? I worked really hard with Ben and Brianna before they got married, but I'm sure they're gonna start discovering if they haven't already certain things that they didn't really know about each other that you can't until you live together. Then you start to get to know certain things and then hopefully you learn to adjust to each other, okay? And so otherwise you end up in breach. Remember, breach from the very beginning. What did I say it was? Missing the mark in a relationship because expectations weren't met, okay? Problem is, it's not fair to have somebody all upset with you because you didn't meet their expectations when their expectations were never agreed to. Which is why the most important exercise I have you do in premarital counseling is the expectations exercise. I want you to share with each other what you expect and what they should expect from you. We are going to have a congregational meeting, by the way. I don't know if I'm gonna do this as publicly as on MTY because a lot of you are out there are also part of the congregation. I think we might just do it that way. Maybe I'll do that next week just to show. I want you to understand what you should expect from me, from your elder, from the other rabbi, from the shamashes, and from each other, and what we should expect from you. So that we could all be in agreement, okay? because I think there's a lot of confusion. There are people upset with me all the time because I won't do this or that or handle this or that, and I have to tell them on the phone all the time, this is not something I have to do. You bring stuff to me that I will handle. 90% of the time is stuff that I am not required in ministry to handle. Neither is elder or anybody else on my staff. But because you need, we try to help. Do you have, but that's one of the expectations that you have to recognize that I will help, but don't push like somehow I'm obligated to do certain things that are not my obligation, okay? We had a person this past week, we've had this several times, who thought that somehow tithing meant that when you needed it, you could get it back. <laughs> and then kept telling me that wasn't what they believed, but then everything they said said that's what they believed. <laughs> Well, I've got this other ministry that I go to and they help me. I said, so why don't you go to them? Because they already gave me what I put in. Now I'm coming to you to get what I put into yours. That doesn't work that way. We're not a bank. It's not a savings account. If you need help, we help you. See, but she didn't need help. She wanted something to be done that was for her own convenience that she needed money to do that was not an emergency and didn't need help, okay? Well, I want to get this bill paid. So what? The bill collector's not going to come and kill you over this bill. You can get it done. I've had bill collectors chase me, haven't all of you? <laughs> we, we all live through that. Oh, but I always pay my stuff on time. Well, apparently now you're not, and I'm not going to make it so that you never miss your, I don't want to keep your streak going. <laughs> It's not my job to keep your streak of being on time going, all right? But there's a lack of understanding of expectation. And so then there's a perceived breach. She's mad at me now because she thinks I breached the relationship, right? Probably mad at me because I'm saying this if she's even listening. But let's understand. Yahweh gives us very clear understanding, at least he should, what happens is man gets in there with empty words and convolutes the deal and messes it up. Bends it, twists it, perverts it, okay? And by pervert meaning it doesn't any longer look like or function like it was intended originally, all right? Pervert doesn't mean it's some like sexual thing. He just takes it and, and makes it something, or we as, as people take it and make it something it shouldn't be. And so it no longer looks like it was supposed to be. And then we sit there going, oh, that's wonderful, okay? It's kind of like looking at a Picasso with both eyes on the same side of the head and we go, oh wow, that's art. But that's what you guys do. You take something that's supposed to be a certain way, you mangle it and twist it into something else and you say, oh look, it's wonderful. No, both eyes are not supposed to be on the same side of the head, okay? Unless you're Picasso, of course, all right? So hopefully this is making sense. Hopefully this helped everybody as we're gonna conclude here with this teaching on sin. I want you to understand that it's all about relationship, expectation, expectations, and breaching them. 
And so you need to, at the end of this, I told you, figure out, seek out, search out what is those things that are pleasing to the master so that it'll be acceptable. So you can hear well done because what you did was acceptable to the master and well pleasing to the master. Amen? Amen. Father, we come before you. And Father, we really want to appreciate this understanding that you're helping us to have about relationships and the breaching of those relationships and what's necessary to thrive in those relationships and the way you use the word sin so we understand what sin is in terms of the breaching of a relationship. And we are to understand what sin against man versus sin against you looks like and how we are to handle those things. And so, Father, we thank you for the insight, for the clarity, for the uh, understanding that we have now been given over these last 12 parts of this teaching about sin in relationship to breaching relationship, how sin is a breach of relationship. So, Father, help us, strengthen us to understand that when we have these challenges, the way we are to deal with it. When it's a breach of relationship with you, we need to teshuva, we need to repent. When to breach a relationship with each other, we need to go to our brother. And if not, then we follow Matthew 18. If that does not work, right? We start there. And by the way, just for everybody who's listening, I know I'm interrupting the prayer. If you have a problem with your brother that requires it or prevents you from actually going to them directly, you, then you can bring it to the, you can skip that step and move up, okay? You can skip that step and move up. Because maybe whatever happened prevents you from being able to go to your brother. All right, so then you just go to step two or step three, all right? So Father, we appreciate so much that you give us the guidance and instruction. You give us the, the processes and protocols of things to do when we have these situations. And really, Father, if we could all embrace it, we so appreciate more than anything else, Matthew 18 when combined with Deuteronomy 17, that you've given us a structure to go to when we don't know what to do or how to handle something. Thank you for that gift, the, the anointing of judging and discernment that you give the leaders who were put in that position. So Father, we thank you, we praise you, we give you all glory and honor as we come before you in the name above all names, Yeshua our Messiah. Amen, amen, amen.